When you hear the phrase soft as steel, what do you think of? While the word steel might conjure up images such as massive high rise buildings, where does the soft part come in? And what exactly does this mean in our work and in our lives? Welcome to the Soft as Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran, featuring engaging conversations with a wide range of industry leaders around soft skills, how we practice love, inclusion, social justice, and compassionate leadership that's everlasting in the workplace. And now, here's Dennis Duran. Today's conversation is one I've been looking forward to for a long time with one of the most outstanding and thoughtful leaders in the construction industry, speaking out in a most influential manner about virtually every aspect of our industry. Sandy Hamby began her career journey working for the U.S. Air Force as an architect. She entered the private sector and a journey with several of the leading firms in the industry, including 3DI, Carter & Burgess, and Jacobs. In 2010, Sandy joined MOCA, and in 2021, she was appointed CEO of MOCA Systems Touch Plan. This journey says so much about the person Sandy is today and why she is widely respected, again, as a thoughtful leader in the industry. I've been honored to know Sandy since we first met at the Construction Management Association of America about 14 years ago. Sandy remains active in that organization and others, and I'm just delighted she's here. So, Sandy, let's get right to it. Welcome to the Soft Steel podcast. Thank you, Dennis. It's my honor. Thank you. I appreciate it. We're going to have an interesting conversation. And I'm going to jump right into something which you know a bit about, you know, what I'm up to and my softest steel thing and the stuff that I'm interested in. And I think we need to be talking about in the industry, which include thinking about what inclusion is all about in the industry is one of the kind of the themes that I talk about quite a bit in a specific way. I want to talk with you today a bit about it and not only it, but about what that means to the challenges we continue to face in the industry to do something about the 5150 percentage versus the 95 to 5 percentage, and I'm alluding to the number of women in the construction industry at all levels, down in the trades where they are desperately needed, desperately need people in general, and also at middle management and senior leadership in organizations in our industry. Where do you think we are today? Looking back over, again, when you came into the industry, you were one of literally a handful of women that were in any kind of position, let alone an architect in a rapidly rising position with the U.S. Air Force, where you were dealing with, not just dealing with men, but dealing with men in uniforms. So when you think about where you started and what you experienced and how you felt about it and where we are today, tell us what you think is going on. That's a really good question, because when I started, it was fairly challenging. What I learned very quickly is to always ask questions in the environment. It was mainly male, and yet I did not sense an overwhelming disparity in terms of how they felt that I was on the site. As long as I asked questions and as long as I had confidence in myself, it was okay. Now, the fact that I would go into board meetings as late as the early 2000s and still be one of the only females in the room was uh, pretty startling. And I think in the last 10 years, that's improved significantly. I speak every year at ENR's groundbreaking conference in San Francisco for women. And it's so exciting because the conference is packed and it's full of construction professionals that are all women. Mm -hmm. And So I'd say that over the last 20, 30 years, the improvement in this has been significant. Now, is there more to go? Yes, absolutely. One of my biggest passions is about education. In fact, it's a call to action, so to speak, to help young women in this industry thrive and provide scholarships to them. You know, construction is often seen as the career path that is what happens when everything else goes wrong. Mm. Mm. You know, you get in trouble as a high schooler, so, oh, you get to go into construction. And I question that, especially for women. I think it is extremely honorable profession. It's hard. It takes intellectual strength. It takes confidence. It takes all the things that many young women have. And it should be the career of choice, Mm -hmm. not the 
default career when you get into trouble. And so I, I always have a call to action to let people know, parents know, you, me, all of us, that it's an exceptional opportunity for young women today is to get into the construction field. And for the most part, you're fairly welcomed. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's still problems on the site. I talk to young women all the time about disrespect on the site, the challenges faced in that regard. But once again, if you treat people with respect, you have the soft skills that you talk about, Dennis, a lot, mm -hmm. and you treat everybody in a fair way, for the most part, you get treated fairly back. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a good, that's a good assessment. You know, it's funny you mentioned, uh, I've got four pillars that I talk about quite a bit. Uh, one of them is inclusion, which we opened up with in terms of a topic. Uh, the other three are love, uh, social justice, and leadership overall. Um, so you, know, you, you just kind of touched on, in a sense, the social justice piece. Which, which which deals with the idea of fairness and equality, uh, not discriminating against people, not harassing people, uh, not seeing people just for what they appear to be, um, which is a challenging task for a lot of people. Um, and as you know, I talk, I talk quite a bit uh, about uh, kind of that fundamental thought that in order for uh, individuals in our industry uh, to have an opportunity to, to pursue a career path, uh, regardless of point of entry, uh, and enjoy some success uh, and maybe a, a great deal of satisfaction on their uh, growth and progress, they have to first understand themselves. Uh, and uh, when you when you have a few of the granularities around when I say understand, or, that's a general thought, uh, but it, it, it deals with what a person's sense of themselves is. Uh, and also, uh, if they are, to use a big term that's getting talked about, I think, and I'm, I'm anxious to hear your thoughts, um, we talk a lot more about uh, about people's personalities or behavioral styles, and also we talk about the the, the lack or the the lack or, or uh, the lack or the the presence of varying degrees of emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, which in and of itself is uh, is in a sense uh, could be argued that it's uh, being able to understand your emotional intelligence and others is in, in a sense is a skill. Um, and it, but it's something that people aren't necessarily aware of. Um, you, you talked about young women. Um, I think I've heard you talk, and it might have been on, on a, a webinar that I had a chance to view. Uh, I enjoyed the way you were talking about uh, the, the, the role and responsibility of the industry uh, to, to tell that story, but to tell it to younger and younger and younger people. S say some more about that. That's exactly right. Um, oftentimes, you know, you could have a a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, a middle school age child that is affected by um, parental influence, by society's influence that when you grow up, you should be a doctor, a lawyer, a, a dentist, a, a teacher, et cetera. And construction's not usually in that frame work of, of discussion. And it's upon the industry to do a better job with that. We should be elevating construction, the trades, the electricians, the welders, et cetera, as professionals that the society depends on. Our built environment is very important for everybody. And it's such an honor to be able to work in this industry. And yet, for some reason, it doesn't get elevated at the very early stages when you're setting yourself up for success. Another thing that's really important is to understand that construction is, is a process that enables everybody to be successful. Oftentimes you see it as a, you know, those architects over there or the owner or change orders or disputes or problem resolution. And I suggest to the entire industry that we need to change that perspective, that we enable all participants in the process to be successful. And that starts at a very young age. You have to be able to teach people that as opposed to, you know, having 15 classes on claims resolution. Mm -hmm. Focus more on what, how can you predict things in advance and how do you work collaboratively together 
to make everybody successful. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, from a profitability standpoint, from a, a happiness standpoint, from a joy enjoyment of what you do, if people could just look at it that way, um, it, we, we, the industry would be better off. Yeah. And, and I see we're kind of getting a swell of that kind of thinking happening. Thanks to, and you know, what you're doing and others are actually focusing on that mm -hmm. more and more. Don't know if that answered your question, but it did kind of skirted both ends of that. Yeah. No, I think, um, no, I think it answered it well. Um, what have you, I mean, what on a first hand, closer first hand basis, what, what kinds of initiatives or, or programs have you, have you seen that you think in particular are, are harbingers of good things to come? But it, you're, it's very interesting because Mocha Systems Inc. is a unique company. It is both a technology, design and construction technology startup environment, as well as regular professional owners rep services. And you know what, Dennis, a lot of people in the industry will say, that's just crazy. Separate the two. Separate the two. And the cultures are different. Mm -hmm. They're very different. So what have we done? I hired a consultant to come in as a cultural initiative consultant to look at the differences between the two cultures, to look at the behaviors, to look at what's important to the company and to start breaking down that bifurcation between, oh, I'm a software geek. Oh, I'm a, you're, I'm a services person. Um, and it's been such an interesting experience because uh, we, we started with training and then we went into um, meetings and, and joint meetings. And this is during COVID too. So it was all on camera. And then we uh, spent the money to bring everybody together mm -hmm. And to start break down, breaking down those assumptions people make uh, relative to the two types of industries that we've combined. So why did we combine them in the first place? You know, there might be a question, should you? Mm -hmm. Well, in, in that regard, from a cultural perspective as well, um, as you know, construction is one of the last industries to really adopt technology efficiently. Mm -hmm. And to go back to what I said about making all participants successful, we believe it takes both, both technology and services together with a innovative mindset balanced by making every entity successful mm -hmm. that could really change the way the industry thinks. And so I know that sounds pretty fluffy, but what we're talking about is changing the way you plan that's collaborative, that allows for ownership, that allows for buy-in. We're talking about processes that enable everybody to have a seat at the table and voice concerns and then establish a framework for decision-making as conflict arises. And once again, that building of of respect amongst uh, colleagues mm -hmm. is incredibly important. And it's one of the things that at Mocha Systems Inc. we will not compromise. Mm -hmm. And that's respect for your colleagues and respect for the process and the collaborative nature of how somebody may be having a bad day, but how do you turn that into something that could, could work for everybody? Yeah. Did this work on culture, did, did it... Um... What did you learn from it, and did it impact how you uh, how you uh, conveyed or stated what your core values were as a as a company? <laughs> it changed him. It, it first of all, I was shocked at how bifurcated everybody was. Those guys over there, mm -hmm. and in fact, it, in my own language, and I'm the one breaking down the barriers. It, it, you know, I would I would say something that would. I'll amplify the divide, mm -hmm. not even realizing it <laughs> and, and giving ourselves permission. And I gave people permission to call me out on it. And it was really fun to see because they did it publicly. And, and I was like, gosh, you're right. Mm -hmm. Let's not, let's not use that phrase anymore. But I was really shocked at how it, all the, the cost estimators, the, it's us. Mm -hmm and them, mm -hmm. schedulers, et cetera, even, even under the same house, mm -hmm. even under the same projects and how people wanted to identify in a group. So how do you let that identification 
actually thrive and at the same time be respectful of those outside the circle and, and keep widening that circle out. Mm-hmm. So I, that's what I learned is bifurcation was much stronger than I thought. Mm-hmm. And then the behavior of change and and how, how to manage that. And I realized I wasn't very good at that. I mean, I could talk about it. I could sense it. But to actually provide methodologies for people to overcome those biases were what was extremely challenging. So we read several books. Um, the Advantage was one of them that just talked about the behaviors. Mm-hmm. And that resulted in changing the core values. And we realized our core values weren't even our core values. They were aspirational values. Yeah. And our core values went back to um, why, why do we exist? Mm-hmm. And then we looked at why do we exist? And it was, okay, we exist to make everybody successful. If you looked at our products, you looked at our services, at why people were hiring us, that's exactly, we, we weren't the, the claims managers. We were not the document, the train wreck in great glossy photos. We were the ones that said, there's a train wreck coming. We, let's all get together and, and mitigate those risks mm-hmm. in advance mm-hmm. and to make a win, 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 win scenario. And so once everybody saw that, that it was really true, that whether it be the product of touch plan or whether it be the, what it, you probably knew it as early project definition and alignment, which we're calling continuous alignment now, mm-hmm. is all about that alignment of expectations and behaviors and decision making that allows the win 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 scenario to mm-hmm. exist. Mm-hmm. Obviously, worth the money to learn because uh, sometimes you you may know it. Uh, but uh, again, it's, it's just like, you know, when you look in a mirror, you may or may not see exactly what's there. Uh, and uh, But if someone kind of holds the mirror up for you and points out a couple of things, then suddenly you can say, ah. Um, and But it, but it takes, it, it takes an, and again, there's a reason, or there's a specific reason. I, I don't know if you, if you caught this. I described you as a thoughtful leader in the construction industry. Uh, and even this conversation illustrates that, that as I've known you over these 14 years, mostly from a distance. Uh, again, one of the one of the marvelous things about about the relationships that start out on a, on a good footing is that they can continue even if there's not a frequency of interaction. Uh, but I think of you that way. I think of you as being a thoughtful leader. Um, I mean, there are a lot of thought leaders, which are in a, they could be visionaries. It could be people that just see what's happening in terms of of technique, materials, methods, all that kind of hard skill stuff. But then there are leaders who are thoughtful who take into consideration. I can learn. More more about myself and and the, and the people that serve our clients in order to to to, to, be, to be better. Uh, you know, get, you know, you're you're doing what my my mentor Steve Farber says when he talks about changing the world, uh, and you've gone about it in what appears to be a very methodical way, which should produce you know a, be, a beneficial step forward and a step up uh, to give your organization the opportunity to build on that uh, and enjoy continued and greater success. Um, so I, I congratulate you. And again, I, I appreciate you for being that kind of a leader. Let's talk about, um, well, I want to share some of this kind of, I, this is me bouncing around. You know that I'm a little goofy about that. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and, and I'd like you to react to this, and we may have, I may have had this conversation with you at some point. Uh, my, my mentor is a guy named Steve Farber, uh, who 21 years ago wrote a book called The Radical Leap, and we've talked about that. Um, and his principles of leadership are love, energy, audacity, and proof. Uh, cultivating love generates energy, uh, inspires audacity, and provides proof. That's kind of the, the framework. Uh, a number of companies in the, in the construction industry uh, have utilized that framework to conduct some of what you described as, as cultural work. Um, but one of his, his best quotes in there, which I, which I used to have in my electronic signature uh, and on my business card, uh, is the following, and it's, uh, do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. Uh, which I think is is simple in a very profound way. Uh, I've always gotten that sense from talking to you about you know, the the challenges of of being in this industry that you've experienced, um, and I think that that's you know, those set of words are probably something that you can say. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I'm sure it does make sense to you. I was visiting Philadelphia last this past week, and I had a chance to meet a recruitment coordinator, a young lady probably about 34 years old. Uh, who was in, had been in the tools of trade as a glazer, 
and she was plucked out um, when she finished up her apprenticeship program and put in, put in charge of doing outreach and conducting activities in high schools and elementary schools to try to tell the story of the trades, not just, not just glazing, but painting and other kinds of trades. Um, and, I, and I shared that quote with her, uh, and she, she sent me an email uh, after I returned home. Um, and she said, I, I forgot that quote. I, I, you know, could you please provide it to me? And I said, sure. And then uh, when, when she, I sent it to her, she sent me back this email. I'll quote it, what she said. She said, thank you. I don't think about my future much. Thank you for reminding me that I do have a future, too. I am always concerned about the student's future. Thank you so much. The code is going on my wall. Um, there's, a, there's a bright young future leader there. Um, yeah. and, that sel- and that selflessness is fundamental. Now, again, it's, it, to me, it's, 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 it's accelerating the benefits of humility, uh, to be selfless, to be thinking about others and not be thinking about yourself. And I think that's what great leaders do. Um, and uh, and, I, and 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 you fit in that category very well. Not sp- just because you're rec- rec- your recognition by the Construction Academy, but you know obviously that singles you out as well. The, the people, the the, the 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 folks in that organization are just you know the rock stars of of generations, uh, which I th- think is impressive. So let's talk about the gen- let's talk about generational stuff. What do you see? Um, again, we've got we've got our generation, which is heading towards the door at some point in time, although I, you know, I, I, I haven't found the door yet, so I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing. Um, and I know that you're, you're passionate about the, your work and trying to lead this company, so I don't, I don't know if, if the idea of, of changing status is even remotely on your mind, and it's none of my business right now. Uh, but so you got our generation. You know, when, you, when you take it down to where the, the, the largest number of, of, of humans uh, are are involved in our industry. We get down again to the trades level, to the field forces, um, and so you know the baby boomers are are retiring. Some of them retired early because of COVID, and you know, we, and, and that whole COVID effect is still a factor, uh, I think, uh, in uh, in just how society views our, you know, the existence of human beings. Um, but so we're we're on we're on the way out the door in, in waves, and they're getting to be bigger and bigger waves. Um, and then we got the millennials and the Gen Xers. Uh, who have different values than the boomers, and, and I'm not going to re-educate people on this, but but the point I want to make is that, and then we've got these really young generations, and that's why what this young lady is doing, what your your thoughts are, are so important. How are we doing with the day to day? And I call it on some days I call it the friction between the generations working side by side in our industry. That's that's an interesting um, thought. Uh, I think. We have an advantage in Monk Assistance because we do combine the technology startup world with um, services. Mm -hmm. Services, meaning professional owners, rep type services, it takes a long time to know, you know, at a very early stage, for example, how much a building's going to cost or what the train wreck might be in, in advance. It takes years of experience. And transferring that knowledge down through the younger generations is difficult. It's not difficult. It just takes time and you have to have the time to do it and you have to have a plan to do it. Um, Getting our young people, what we do is we, first of all, we ask them the question, what do you love? Mm -hmm. And that gets to um, operational questions versus, um, you know, the, the creative side questions. And then we try to place people in a, in a location that they will thrive in because they like coming to, to work to do what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Another thing about our company is um, there's a lot of autonomy. And so behaviorally, uh, even at a young level, uh, by, you know, in their 20s, mm-hmm. we um, give a lot of autonomy. We put in a safety net, but they have a lot of authority to do what they need to do. Mm-hmm. And of course, fully knowing that they're going to make mistakes mm-hmm. and then having yeah. the safety net to share the mistake and to say, well, let's, let's try a different approach next time. Get, you know, uh, it goes to the fear of failure, right? Mm-hmm. That they have permission to, to make those mistakes and, and sometimes fail. Then on the software um, environment, it's, it's a very fast-paced, young perspective that almost gets in reverse, you know, uh, in terms of, oh, you're, you're too old to understand this. 
you know, you, you couldn't possibly, you know, keep up with me kind of attitude. So you, you get in our company, you have both kind of sentiments happening at the same time. And as we broke down the bifurcation between the units, it was really interesting because a whole new dynamic started to form. And let's just look at one, you know, innovations in our core. So let's look at one thing. What is the effect of AI mm. on our industry mm -hmm. and how could we use it beneficially rather than sitting back saying, oh, no, it's going to take our jobs away. We're not looking at it that way. We're looking at it as how can we um, create jobs through the use of this and what what's its potential. Mm -hmm. So we set up a, a group of volunteers saying, who wants to do some research on that, on this? And it was all ages. It was everybody together. It was services. It was software. It was technology. It was administration or operations people. And it, we're just at the start of it. So I don't have a result yet mm -hmm. for you, but we encourage that kind of, and we spend money on it, Dennis, that innovative thought that takes advantage of, of gosh, we have from, 20 to 90 in our company in age wow. age groups. Wow. And how, how do you facilitate that? Yeah. And yeah, it's been, it's, it is interesting, yeah. you know, cause one person has a flip phone and the other, other side of the fence, you know, they're coming in with, you know, AutoCAD and BIM and right. everything's connected and flying drones and robots and everything else. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. it's fun. Yeah, they're, they're carrying what used to occupy an entire floor of a building on, in their hands. You know, for yes. some of them. So, yeah, our, augmented reality. All right. So that, and, and I think that I, I, I think that your experience and your company's experience is is uh, is informative with regards to the kind of the the the, the interplay of generations. And I think the AI thing is 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 a, is a is a very innovative way to bring the generations together to tackle something which everybody needs to tackle. We, you know, because or we can just sit back and say, all right, well, whatever, you know, and, and so I can. I can go into ChatGPT and, you know, just say, ask a few questions and produce these beautiful results. And I could publish those and I could do blogs or, you know, whatever. But that's that's just kind of a lazy man's exercise. What you're doing is, you know, is it's got is got purpose and will benefit not only your business, but also will benefit the industry. Because um, I, I would describe your company as a hybrid company. Uh, again, you've got professional services and you've got technology services. Um, and so just by the virtue of the fact that you have them now housed in the same entity and they're, they're, they're interacting with each other on a daily basis, that's, that's a model that uh, uh, will be very informative for other companies to look at. Uh, so don't tell anybody because that will be your competitive. I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to tell anybody about this conversation. Well, no, that's not true. I'll, you know, <laughs> but um, all right. So um Let's let's talk for let's stay on on the on the AI thing for a minute um, and kind of broaden to say what are what are the things on the horizon in in the realm of technology uh, that that you, your your company just by virtue of who you are and and what your outlook is uh, probably are, are paying attention to thing, some things that other people aren't necessarily paying attention to what do you what are you seeing as far as how technology is coming into the industry in process in in strategy etc cetera, etc cetera? what are your thoughts well what we're looking at right now and doing some research on is how we could take advantage of the large amount of data that's created and sometimes um it's so overwhelming, you don't know what to do with it. But if we could synthesize what we call, quote unquote, the right data, the important data that and enable trend work, for, for example, touch plan um, has some real um, information on, on construction durations and activities mm -hmm. and what it really takes in the environment. And what if you could be able to take that information and combine it with say the AutoCAD information or Procore or financial cash flow information and predict trends um, in the future of, of either problems or efficiencies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the supply chain problems and with the labor problems that we have, how can we use that information to make the entire team more efficient in the field uh, via use of of AI and um, use of trending. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, that's the kind of thing we're studying right now. Now with, with the chat GPT and, and the, that type of AI, that AI, that's just the tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. 
right? That it, it took a long time to get, you know, a system that predicts what the next word would be. Yeah. But if you look at true AI, and I'm not going to call it true AI, that's the wrong word. Um, if you look at AI and step back a little bit, uh, like the the cars, the driverless cars, mm -hmm. where they're actually interacting mm -hmm. with live humans and environment, mm -hmm. then that is taking that concept even further. It, it's not just predicting your next word or being able to, you know, search the internet and gather all the information. Now we're talking about using a wide database to interact with humans. Mm -hmm. What would that look like in the construction environment? Mm -hmm. And, you know, robots are starting to, to go down that road, of course. And um, the, the use of the information from drones, not just to write a nice report, but to actually look at predictive next steps and risks that come up and say, hey, team, you should be looking at this because in three months you're going to have a problem. So let's all get together and, and, and modify this. That's what we're looking at. Um, it, giving a little more certainty into the environment and how can you take the standard data or AI, use massive amounts of com, uh, computing power to make it safer, to make it more efficient, mm -hmm. to predict problems in advance so that change orders are not as significant because the projects are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So these uh, the projects, you know, are in the billions now yeah. it takes joint ventures. So yeah. how, how can we, how can we do that better? Yeah. I just had a chance to, uh, a few weeks ago, I deliver some programs for, uh, <clears throat> Barton Mallow. Uh, and, uh, I took, I took a workshop to one of their job sites, the, uh, the Ford battery plant in Glendale, Kentucky, which is just a huge site footprint. Just on, I mean, it was, it was, took my breath away. I mean, just, uh, and, and I also get to see it a little bit here, right, right within about 25 minutes from where I live here in Georgia, uh, there's a Hyundai plant that's being constructed right off of uh, Interstate Highway. And again, huge footprint, many implications, many jobs for in construction, many opportunities to try to use the technologies that are available uh, to improve the efficiency of the job, data capture, and a whole bunch of other things. And uh, so I find it really interesting. Um, let me. I'm gonna. I want to. I want to kind of close our time together, which is sadly almost up. I'm sure you're. You're. You're, you're probably had enough by now. Have you? you are you good? <laughs> yeah. I'm good. Okay. All right. Let's go back. Let's go back and 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 put uh, and put a wrap on on our conversation by coming back to women. Um, and and so this is kind of our last question. Um, I mean, I could ask you a question about what do, what do women do better than men and all that kind of stuff. We can all just we can read research and learn all those kinds of things. But um, I want to try to say it a different way uh, today, as you know, and, and you've correctly said the progress is being made at different levels in in the industry, at the top, in the middle, and below at the bottom. But we got a long way to go. I think that's what I heard you say. You know, more, there's more to do. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. um, so the question is this: Why and what? are men afraid of relative to women in the industry mm -hmm. that's a good question i've never really thought of it in those in that in those terms i think that what women bring often is that collaborative nature uh they that the, and, and i'm generalizing which may not be fair but I'll, I'll keep going down this road a little bit um the the idea that everyone could be successful or that it, it's not a diehard competition, and yet, you know, you're in a competitive environment. I, I get that. But um, I think that's difficult for men to comprehend in terms of how the industry has always been done. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about a transformation in how construction is accomplished, design and construction. And that's hard in a in a in it by itself. Right. Let alone that it it could be a lot of women driving that that idea forward. Mm -hmm. And so, if if the question was what is what causes men to be afraid, I think that might be it. Is that they'd have to learn a new process that is not natural or taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll come more natural to the younger generations than it will to the older ones. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's a, that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, pretty reasoned answer. I would challenge one thought that when I, I I asked in a very general way, but you know you know what I have in mind is that you know, and I talk a lot about this as you as you know, you know I talk about the dynamic of being a person among other people, uh, and and our industry talks a lot about collaboration, talks a lot a lot about working on teams, uh, and all those kinds of uh, aspirational thoughts. At least in many places, they're they're really you use the word aspirational in slightly different context, but around the same notion. And so, you know, what I think it boils down to is uh, is something which is is not a gender related issue at the end of the day, and that is that you know, it, it, but it is generational to a certain degree, and that is that uh, that if if we are if we are not fully confident in a, in a proper way and comfortable with ourselves in the environment we we're in, um, that's a fear based consideration. Uh -huh. uh, if we don't if we if we don't have experience with haven't done it before, haven't seen it done. And, and that kind of wide swath thought cut across a lot of men who have had little or no experience with women working side by side at any level in the organization, even though, the, again, the numbers are going higher. But I saw something about it, like a 50% increase from one year to another in women in managerial roles. But I think the starting number was like, I don't know, a couple of hundred. So out of uh, 17,000 or some huge ridiculous number. So when you do the percentage, it's not a, such a big deal. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it does. And it gets a little bit to the point I was trying to make with when you're changing an environment, it's uncomfortable and the confidence level drops. And then you have new relationships building mm -hmm. between men and women mm -hmm. and the environment's changing. So I think that's exactly where some of the uncomfortable behavior Yeah resides yeah. is in that lack of confidence because it's all new in mm -hmm. that regard and letting people be comfortable to your point on soft skills and what you write about in your book yeah. is that there are very effective ways to eliminate that kind of mistrust that builds from something new yeah. through soft skills yeah. and um it, there's going to be a lot more of that required as we go forward because it's going to change a lot yeah AI is going to change the way things are done. The processes are already changing. Mm -hmm. Contractors are absorbing more of the design work than they ever used to before. So we're almost flipping back to, you know, the master builder mm -hmm. that existed quite a long time ago. And with that comes a lot of new people involved. Right. And right. the younger generation is much more comfortable. They don't see things the way we do in terms of color and exactly. background, et cetera, they're much more open. And so I'm excited to see how that plays yeah, out. I agree with you entirely. I'm, I'm surprised it didn't come up early in the conversation, but that's exactly right. You said it perfectly. Among other things, they don't see color, uh, which right now continues to be a simple but powerful and sad and very unfortunate condition that still exists in large parts of our country. It always makes me sad, but, uh, you know, I'll get up in front of a group of people and, you know, there'll be uh, some number of people who are another color other than white in the traditional sense. And uh, I'll take the hit as being the old white guy in the room because we, we're making things harder. And that's why it's nice that we're fading away because, I mean, you, you were mentored by some incredible men over your career. I know who some of them are through hearing you talk. I've met them. I've socialized with them. I respect them as well. But the way they were used to addressing a woman, just today, you flat out, to put it in simple, you don't try to get away with it today, just because the young people will not tolerate it. Because, you know, they expect that you treat me the way I treat you. And I think that's a powerful opportunity. But I think we've got a generation or two ahead of us before we'll see things balancing out. And so dignity and respect in relationships and happiness are things to look forward to more and more in the future. Sandy, it's been a delight to talk to you. If you got something else to say, please. No, I was just going to say, I read an article about the Marlins general manager. I think her name is Ng. I can't remember her first name, but yeah, really interesting. First female general manager in, in baseball. Yeah. And just, they did an interview with her and it reminds me of, you know, her responsibility as a role model, et cetera. Yeah. Very interesting story. 
Thank you, Dennis. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I was going to mention one, I had a couple of last thoughts. One is that you mentioned interesting people. I just learned, and I don't know how long she's been in the position, but ACOM, which is obviously a huge services company, is headed up by Laura Poloni. Yeah. I don't know if you know her or not, but she, from what I've seen, she looks impressive. Yeah. And, uh, very dynamic. Yeah. I do not know her, but yes, she is. Yeah. I've read her bio. Well, thanks for giving me your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Appreciate your time, Dennis. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of the Softest Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran. Dennis is the author of Softest Steel and a leading speaker and trainer for organizations across many industries and verticals. To learn more about the work Dennis is doing to activate soft skills in the workplace, contact him at DennisDuranSpeaking.com. Be sure to check out his book, Soft as Steel, on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you'd like to get your podcasts. And please remember to share this episode with your friends, colleagues, and anyone you feel would benefit from the conversation. We'll see you next time on the Softest Steel podcast with Dennis Duran. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.